What's up, everybody? Hello, everyone. Hopefully, you can see us here live now. I'm going to watch the view count. So, or the viewer count. We go up. Oh, did we lose Gary? No, oh, he's there. There he is. Looks like he's there. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, thanks for having me on, Jason. I know this is my second time, but first time co-hosting with you. So I appreciate the invite and uh, happy to spend this afternoon. I'll be live streaming until for the next three hours, I guess, in theory. <laughs> with yeah, real flight after this, so. yeah, yeah. So yeah, thanks for joining us, Steve. Uh, obviously, for those tuning in now, uh, we Cody is no longer with us. So you won't see Cody here anymore. He went to North Carolina this week. Uh, some people were asking how he was doing. He, I think he went with his wife to check out their new place, to check out the flight school. I think he took a couple flights. I know his uh, wife was checking out her new job. And uh, yeah, I saw them posting some pictures from the beach. So oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, is that. Yep. And so, uh, yep. So Steve, for those that don't know Steve, uh, Steve Petrato is the director of marketing on the aircraft side of things for Horizon Hobby. So he is in charge of all the brands that have aircraft in them, uh, including Spectrum. And radio, so, yeah, air and radio. Yep. And radio, yes, exactly. And real flight and uh, so on and so forth. And so he's uh, graciously agreed to co-host with us today. And uh, today we have Gary Wright with us. And so I think some people that are customers of ours and viewers right now will know Gary. Uh, some people will not know Gary. So we're going to go into his background a bit. Uh, he's been in the hobby quite a long time. And we were just talking. I first met him almost 20 years ago. And I don't even think he realizes, though, that uh, I had been keeping tabs on him from before that, uh, back in the old E3D days. And I was using Kyosho endoplasma motors and helicopters and other airplanes. I think Gary probably knows what I'm talking about there. Most of the people that are watching are going to be like, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, but that Kyosho endoplasma was a very special motor. So We'll get to that here in a minute, but uh, without further ado, we'll again introduce Mr. Gary Wright, who is a product developer here at Horizon Hobby and uh, recently worked on the Night Timber X, which was announced yesterday. Oh, did we lose Gary? No. He, well, he wasn't, it didn't look like he was moving for a minute there, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, Gary will be here eventually, so. Yeah, all right. Bummer. Well, uh, I guess until Gary gets back, it looks like he's coming back in. There he is. Uh, there he is. Oh, yeah, let's pop him back in the stream here. Yeah. There you go. Hey, right. you okay there, Gary? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm within like two feet of the X, the wireless access point here, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, this. I think these streams are very, very uh, bandwidth heavy. Um, so yeah. hopefully everything works reliably from here on out. I usually close all my browsers and everything just to make sure it's not, not stealing right. bandwidth. So, uh, all right, great. So we got you back. Let's see. We've got some comments coming in. We've got, uh, we're pushing about a hundred live viewers now, and I think it's continuing to go up. So actually what we might do is I may still go ahead and share this over to a couple other pages so we can get some more guys on. Uh, but yeah, in the meantime, Gary, I was reintroducing you as product developer, Horizon Hobby, mentioned that you had just uh, recently worked on the Night Timber X, which we announced yesterday. Right. And then also not long ago, we announced the UMX Turbo Timber, which you also had a hand in as well. So before we Correct. get to those products though, let's talk about your history. So let us know, when did you start flying? How did you start flying? And then how did you end up coming to work at Horizon Hobby? Oh, I see. Um, well, I've been in the hobby a few years. I started in 79, got my first plane on my 12th birthday, um, and then built a Falcon 56, if people remember the Goldberg Falcon, and learned to fly on it. Um, so I've been at this 40 years. It'll be 41 in a couple months. Uh, started helicopters about eight years later. Um, so fly the Whirly Birds also. <laughs> uh, I worked in IT for many years, and in 2013, with the changes in health care, with the um, Unaffordable Care Act, uh, I didn't have a job anymore. <laughs> so that's when I moved to Champaign and um, started working with my hobby, so to speak, with HobbyCo. And then, of course, Horizon was a natural progression after the um, failure of HobbyCo. Yes. Now, I think in the interim, prior to you going to work at Habaco, 
you had actually, to some degree, had your own business, and then we're also working with other businesses to kit ARF, maybe even consult on power systems, uh, so they could sell different models that were your own design. Is that correct? Yeah. You're breaking up. <laughs> yeah, you're Might breaking be. up really bad. But, huh? Uh, Maybe yeah, me. It might From be you. 2000 till about 2008. I, uh -huh. uh, I had a small side business where I designed models. Um, some may remember the E3D if they were in the hobby at that time. And I had eight or nine other models that I kitted during that eight year span where I had the um, model business. Mm -hmm. That's right. So uh, I'm not sure, Gary, if you if you can hear us okay. I think it's cutting out on your end because Steve and I are both coming in loud and clear. So hopefully it continues to work well. So yes, yeah. the, the E3D. It might be. Let me shift this other. <laughs> I'm going to shut this other computer down. <laughs> <laughs> we over there streaming some, uh, some internet videos or... <laughs> Well, we might have just lost them again. That's all right. Well, uh, uh, well no, you're kind of there. No, you're no, sort no, of there. working on a design. Um, and <laughs> okay, oh, this is on. bad. <laughs> yeah, Garrett. Both of your faces are frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. Woohoo! I can. We can sort of hear you. It's it's coming back. Hold on a minute. I'm gonna get a cable. All right, you figure that out. Jason and I will talk for a bit. Sorry, I'm going to get a else. cable and plug in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Daryl Carpenter says that's old man internet speed right there for you. Harsh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. Well, um, we, when Gary comes back, we'll, we'll dive back into it. Um, Jason, let's let's just kind of talk a little bit about the, the Timber X launch. I think that's, you know, not a lot of folks' minds right now. Um, you know, we've had great a great reaction to it. Some folks that are, um, I guess Gary comes out from underneath the table. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to pop him out of the stream here so we don't get yeah. any crotch shots. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we had some great reaction to it. We had some folks that are, you know, oh, another timber. But, you know, talk talk through a little bit of the, the thought process be, behind bringing this to, to market. I know you've probably been on other uh, streams this week or maybe done a couple of videos here and there. But for those of the folks that are watching, Talk through the kind of the process on the Timber X. Yeah, so guys give us a hard time all the time when we release either updates to a model or a variation of an existing model, or in this case, another Timber, as some people say. But let's be very clear that Timbers are very popular, guys. And not everybody has one, but a lot of people do. And uh, the Knight Timber X is not intended to replace the Timber X per se, but the idea was that we wanted to take one of our already existing designs that was well-rounded, which I think the Timber X is extremely well-rounded. It can fly slow, it can do aerobatics, it can do 3D aerobatics, uh, and then put lights in it so it would be a night flyer. And then at the same time, we had the opportunity to integrate smart electronics. So a smart ESC, a new generation Spectrum AR637TA receiver, which has full range telemetry. So we figured, hey, you know, it's a good opportunity to uh, add like a higher trim level of the Timber X. And so it just is kind of an add on to, um, you know, the features you can choose either the standard Timber X without lights, without smart, or you can spend a little bit more, just like if you were buying a, you know, a, a platinum trim truck, you know, you can yeah. buy that as the night Timber X, you get smart, you get lights. Uh, it's a win-win situation. I think for most guys that already have a Timber X, you know, they may not see a need for one, but when you're shopping for a new night flyer or if you're shopping as it, looking at the Timber X in particular, I think the night Timber X is a very compelling uh, kind of option. Yes, it is more expensive. Obviously, the lights come at an added cost and smart comes at a little bit of an added cost, uh, but we think it's a good complement to the line. And uh, at the same time, it also replaces, not a lot of people know this, we don't have a lot left, but the night vision air will kind of be going away and the night Timber X kind of takes its, its spot in our lineup. So sure, um, sure. it's an extension of the Timber franchise, but also it's a, a night flyer that gives a lot more people a lot more options of where and when they can fly. Yeah, definitely. Well, Gary, it looks like we got you back. So Yeah. 
glad you, uh, you know, I got a text from Allie. He said, didn't Gary just say he worked in IT? <laughs> Which is perfect. <laughs> Typical Allie Machinchi comment. Uh, yes. <laughs> I was just disabling Wi-Fi and I plugged in a cable. <laughs> it looks better. It sounds better. So hopefully that means it's going to work better. Hope so. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, let's jump back into into you, Gary. I mean, I know yeah. we we were kind of chatting about, um, I guess, gosh, where were we? What what you how you got into the hobby and and then what your first airplane was? I guess I kind of forget now. Where where were we, Jason? Do you remember? Hey, we're, yeah, we're talking about the E3D in particular, yeah. which I think you kitted back in late '90s, early 2000s. I, I kitted the E3D in 2000 or 2001, and we saw those kits through 2008. We also arfed it around 2004 um, and sold what I find out now working in the industry was a very, very large number of them. Um, we actually shipped that model to 27 different countries. So they were yeah. flying around the world. Yeah, it was a cool airplane. I bought one of the kits right when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And I built, I built one immediately. And uh, I actually had an interesting learning curve on that airplane because back then 3d was still kind of newish. And right. I always thought that, you know, 45 degrees of elevator throw was enough. So I hinged it. So it pretty much would start to bind at 45 degrees to keep the hinge gap as small as possible. Right. And then after flying it a little while, I was like, I want more elevator throw. And right. so I had to cut right. the hinges and rehinge it with a huge elevator gap so I could get 60 yeah. degrees of throw. And then I just put some tape to seal the gap and it worked right. great. Uh, but I flew that original one with the power system that you designed and developed. And I think the reason that I bought that airplane and other people bought that airplane was that because you, you could actually get it to hover, which back then was a big deal with electric. Right. You could get it to hover with a brushed car motor, and right. a $20 motor, $20 gearbox. And, you know, I think it was a 12.8 APC prop or something like that. It sounds about right. 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 And a 10 cell, not a lot of guys will know this, but a 10 mm -hmm. cell NICAD or nickel metal high drive battery. Yeah. And it would hover and fly. Yeah. And then um, when the first LiPos came out and Charlie, who you worked for, yep. he sent me a 3S 8000 pack. Uh, if you remember at the time, the first LiPos, we only had um, very low C LiPos. It was a 5C, 5C. first, I believe. Uh, so it was an 8000 milliamp pack. And it was actually lighter than the 10 cell NICADs that I flew in the plane. And I went from six or eight minute flights up to 40 minute flights with that. Wow. Yeah, that was, it was a, it was a huge deal. I remember the first time I went out and flew it and I stopped flying in about 20 minutes because I didn't have a proper LVC. If you remember that Great Plains ESC that a lot of us used, I don't think it right. had uh, a programmable low voltage cutoff because lipos weren't even a thing back then. And so I was always paranoid about over discharging my battery. Yeah. So I would land after 20 minutes and charge it. And I'd put in 3000 milliamp, 3,300 milliamp. I'm like, what, how yeah. is that possible? And uh, yeah, that really, really roughly. In fact, to be honest, I remember I went out and flew two batteries in a row and burnt out the motor. Right. And that was right. when I was right. like, you know what? I got to buy a brushless motor. So I bought the hacker right. C40. Put that, yeah, in. That, that motor was pushed to uh, within an inch of its life for a six minute flight. So with the lipos, it was just pushed too far. But the, the biggest issue that I saw with LiPos initially is the availability of chargers. Right. Uh, there, were, there were really two issues. Uh, the best charger out there charged at a half amp. The Schultz is 636. $400 charger, and it would charge a LiPo at a half amp. So in an 8,000 milliamp pack, it scares me to death to think about it now, but you that go to bed. house charging for 16 hours for one 40 minute flight. Um, and there were no balance ports on <laughs> the batteries and there was no balancing on the charger because we didn't understand we needed to balance them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that was a, a big, big, a whole world changed relatively quickly around that time. Right. Uh, chargers had to be updated. Power systems, ESCs had to be updated with proper low voltage cutoffs. Right. Um, Brushless motors really exploded then too, because now you could really take advantage of their higher efficiency, their cooler running, no right. brushes to wear out. And, and that was a big thing because now we're flying 20 or 30 minutes at a flight instead of the you know five right. minutes or so that we had flown with brushed motors before. I remember I, I bought that Schultz charger uh, and then I believe Great Plains, if you remember the Electrofly Triton charger came right. out right. and that okay. could do, if I'm not mistaken, it could do four cells up to four cells at two and a half amps. 
Right, right. Yeah, was, so like, guys, like, yes, it was amazing. We could charge our 8,000 batteries in about three hours time. Right. And I remember the super, I would, it, it, to be honest, that I, it, I don't recommend this to anybody now, but I did used to do this back then. I would go to sleep with two batteries on two chargers and yeah. I'd have four batteries to charge. And after three and a half hours, four hours, the chargers would start going off and I'd wake up and I'd switch my batteries. So that way I had batteries to buy the next day. Yeah, I can't, I can't count the number of times I left multiple chargers going in a motel room at an event and I went to sleep and didn't think anything of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's kind of, kind of scary and unsafe. Hey, St Steve, what was your first uh, charger? Was it a Triton? Uh, I think it was a Triton because I was working for Hobbytown USA and I was in high school uh, and I'm positive it was a Triton. I think that was like my first. No, no, it wasn't. It was an MRC brain. Oh, I remember Perfect. the brain. Yeah, yeah, I remember the brain. yeah, the ACDC. Yeah. And I, I did own a Triton, I think, after I bought a Triton. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a yeah, MRC brain, which was purple, I believe. And then, yeah, the Triton. It was. Yeah. I remember and that. I, had, I, gave, I, gave, I, gave, I gave the Triton to my brother, who still owns it, uh, up until last week when I sent him a new smart charger. So, oh, uh, it lived a long life. <laughs> It did. That charger was kind of ahead of its time. And that really kind of made LiPo's a little bit more accessible. Uh, and then back then, not a lot of people understand this, but we didn't use small LiPo batteries and small park fires. Park fires weren't even a thing, really. They were around, um, but what really exploded the doors off park flyers and even ultra micro flyers were LiPo's in particular. And a lot of the electric planes we were flying back then, the E3D, I would consider a midsize airplane. And then we were flying bigger airplanes as electric. Um, conversions from, you know, 120 size four strokes or 23 cc gas we were flying as electric. So back then electric was very expensive. Those three S8000 batteries, if I'm not mistaken, we were selling them for like $300, $250. Yeah, that's about what it was. Yeah. And about a year after that, we did the electric demos at the last tournament of champions in Vegas. And, um, we were flying a couple airplanes that were flying on 10 S8000 LiPos. Yeah, the Katana. Yeah. Or Fontana. 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 Yeah, and it's it's strange to think about what people paid for batteries back in those days. People complain about pricing now. Yeah. And they have no idea what it used to cost. Yeah. yeah, I think a good example is 6S5000, which is a mainstay battery, you know, roughly $100. You can get some cheaper ones. You can get some more right. expensive ones. And that's not chump change. Don't get me wrong. But right. back, back in the day, first off, 6S wasn't a thing. Like 5S, 6S became the new what 5S was back in the day. And so what you guys are flying, the 5S 4P batteries, I know for a fact we were selling those for $400 each, and it took two to fly one flight. Right. So at eight hundred dollars worth of batteries, you had probably a two hundred to three hundred dollar either Schultz or you know maybe a Castle Creations ESC back then, uh, yeah. and a hat remote that was four hundred five hundred bucks. It was a you know two thousand dollar power system in a you know one twenty size airplane. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and um, talking about the pricing of things, when I got in this hobby in seventy nine, my first radio was a six channel with three servos. No servo reversing, no digital trims, none of that. And it was 250 bucks. <sighs> think about that. Now. That would be 1500 bucks, I think, or maybe yeah. a thousand. That's and great. If you, um, the, the servos that came with it, two were reversed and, or two was, two were normal and one was reversed. So if you needed a reversed servo for something, you either had to buy another servo or figure out, how to get the linkage to go to the other side of the servo. Yep, mechanical. Mechanical yeah. reversing. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it was two or three times the cost of what it is now. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, well, so I'm uh, certainly glad those times are over. And yeah. uh, I know when I was at uh, Atlanta Hobby, when I was working there through college, we were getting the, the I got, what generation were the Thunder Power Packs that were black and then silver with the white label? So we had the Gen Gen ones had they were silver with the blue stripe. Gen two were silver with the yellow stripe. Gen yeah. three is when we started changing to black. There was also a Gen two and a half in there with a tan stripe. Yeah. Okay. For like particular. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that's when I got into brushless and lipo. So <laughs> red round. Yeah. And Atlanta Hobby was uh, way ahead of the curve on not only uh, understanding that stuff but also selling it. You know, I remember Cliff was one of our biggest customers at Thunder Power, and then when I went to Horizon as well, and he was oh, yeah. very, very, 
very in touch with Hacker and Castle Creations. And I think he really helped build a lot of those brands into the mainstays that they are today. So, right. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a cool time. I miss those days. I got I got to be honest. You know, you hear this all the time. I miss the good old days. Those days, things were just, there was so much excitement around electric right. and around not only electric, but 3D airplanes at that time were a really big thing, which I got very heavy into 3D airplanes and electric power. And uh, and then helicopter, electric helicopter 3D flying as well was a big deal. If you, I think you were flying also Gary Mikado back then when I was. Correct. Correct. The Logo 10, that was a good helicopter back in its day. It was. It was a good time, yeah. And before everyone... Um, before everyone thought that they needed 485 gigawatts of power, we were getting 20 and 30 minute flights on those helicopters. Yeah, and it was power that we had previously. Yeah. Yep. That was the thing is I think it went from we were happy to get good performance for five minutes with a nickel metal. Right. To now we have equivalent uh, lipo replacements that were four times the capacity, and we can now fly the same right. way for 20 minutes. But then people were like, well, wait a second, maybe instead of flying for 20 minutes, I should get more power and fly for 10 minutes. And then it became, oh, let's just get more power and fly for five minutes. And that's the performance level that I think the world is at today, where we've accepted back the four to five minute flight times for very high performance applications, EDFs and right. um, 3D helicopters, 3D airplanes. But, you know, at the same time, I, I miss those good old days of going out and flying my logo and doing it was I wouldn't say hardcore smackdown 3D. No. But it was really aggressive 3D for 20 minutes, and it was fun. Right, right. It was geriatric 3D, like I fly helicopters now. <laughs> yeah, slow-mo 3D, old man-style 3D, as they yeah. say, with low head speed. Back then, I mean, we were flying like 2,000 RPM head speed, and people were like, oh, my gosh, that's scary. I'm afraid your helicopter's right. going to come apart. And now when you, you spool up at like 1,800 RPM, people are like, is that it? Do you, right, you know how right, <laughs> right. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. I miss those days. So, so you said your first radio was in the late seventies, right? It was, I assume, twenty-seven megahertz. No, no, it was seventy-two. Okay, and so no trims. No, it had trims. It was it was actually a, a radio made by Kraft. It was sold through Tower Hobbies. It had a Tower Hobbies name on it, and it was in a white case. But it was essentially a Kraft Sport six channel in a white. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Steve, what was your first radio? A JR Black and Silver. What is it? Max? 80, no. 60. Computer radio? 8103. Yeah, it was computer radio. It wasn't that. It's was the same case as like our, um, the original the DX. DX. Yeah. Yeah, 650. So we had, there was a 622, a 652, and a 662. I thought it was, a four, digit. I thought it was four digit. I don't if know. it was four digit, that's a, that was one of the nicer ones, like the seventy two hundred two. Oh, there was a sixty two hundred two or sixty one hundred two or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was was like that. yeah. yeah. I had that for a while, and then uh, eventually went to Spectrum. So but never yeah. looked. Back. Yeah, and I know. <laughs> so Gary is actually somewhat new to the Spectrum world, right? Yeah, it just happened in the last year or two, right? Yeah, a couple years ago. A couple years ago, and it was a bit of a learning curve, right? Um, yeah, a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, I really love the stabilized receivers. Yeah, I wish I had AS3X in everything I own, but I'd need more receivers then. <laughs> oh, real quick. I, I, see, I see a question in here. This is something that comes up every once in a while, so I'm going to address it real quick. Corey, or as a hobby killer of our top flight kits. Actually, Corey, that's not true. Um, the the truth is, and I, and I, I don't – always like to to be so so direct but the truth is there was no market for kits or there's not much market for kits and you right. know gary sold kits for years i've built kits i like kits i won't build one again but i think there's a lot of people like me that you know if you can get an art for the same price as a kit why would you spend the time building it now there are companies that make kits and they're going to be around probably for a while but that segment of the hobby has shrunk considerably and there's just it, it wasn't financially viable i mean part of the reason Habico went out of business was well, that. and the other thing, and I'm sure Gary could attest to this, but I mean, I was on the team that talked about this uh, at the, at a higher level in the company. And I mean, frankly, guys, it was, we couldn't fire up the old die cut machinery and we couldn't find a vendor to take that machinery that how uh, hobby car or how great planes was producing it. So we either had the decision and we did look into this 
go to find a vendor who could recreate the kits on a laser cut. Um, but as I'm sure Gary knows very well, it's very hard to take a die cut processed or a die cut designed aircraft and bring it to a laser cut process. Um, and we tried, tried and tried and tried to figure out a way to bring it back. And ultimately it just became a financially impossible to do for the business. And it just didn't make sense. Right. That's actually worse than starting from scratch. If you <laughs> put it in CAD and make it a laser cut it takes longer than it does just doing a new airplane from scratch. And having done that over many, many designs, it takes a lot of hours to get that done. And um, CAD designers time is not cheap. <laughs> right. Yeah. Really a good one. So, I mean, so, I, the way I say it is there, every one of us uh, within the business and the air side wanted to have a reason to keep kits around. We wanted to keep doing mm -hmm. it. And if, if we could come up with a business plan that made sense for the company, uh, we would do it again. And right now, it's just not. It feasible. doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah so it, doesn't, it doesn't make business sense from, from a lot of ways, from the production side of things. But then ultimately what that results in is a higher price if we were to do it and that people just weren't willing to pay or aren't willing to pay for it. Yeah. 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 And I was on a, I was on the podcast recording the, our podcast that Chris Dickerson and I do earlier. And, and one of the things he mentioned was, you know, sometimes it's hard to distance your passion for the hobby for a business, you know, business decision. And in a lot of, in a lot of ways, I mean, Gary, Jason, we've all been down the path of, man, I really want to do this project, but when the rest of the team sees it and talks it through, it just doesn't really make sense. And we don't think right. it will actually fly and be profitable and, and keep us alive as a company. Um, so that's a lot of those decisions get pushed away where our passion, we're, you know, we want this back. And I mean, trust me, I was on the team of, we need kits because it's part of the hobby. Right. Um, but when you look at the financials and you look at everything else to make it happen again, it was just, it just didn't make sense. It would have been a losing endeavor. And that's ultimately yes, we, we killed kits, but kits killed themselves based on the agenda. Yeah. So, yeah, it's unfortunate, but true. And so we, again, guys, we didn't want it to be the case, but we are a business at the end of the day, passion aside. And uh, that was the decision we made. I see Jason Beaver making a little bit of a comment here. Oh, they just wanted another timber. That's why. And, you know, I've seen Jason posting on Facebook and I, I, Hey man, I get where you're coming from. And, you know, I, I have a post on RC groups where I explain this in detail. We come out with a few dozen airplanes a year. Um, some of those airplanes are refreshes. Sometimes we're, it's going to be a timber. You're not going to love every release that we have, but you know, we, we try to come out with a, a wide variety of airplanes from small to large, from foam to balsa, from 3D to scale. And, you know, we're not going to make everybody happy with every release, but just keep watching, man. You never know. The next one we come out with maybe the app, the one you were waiting for. You, you never know. It, the next one's not a timber. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, definitely not a timber. <laughs> um, yeah, I see the threads on RC Group about uh, there's a thread going right now that's been going since last November. People think they're getting a very early start saying um, Horizon Civilian Airplanes for 2020. This is what we want. Well, November of last year, um, everything for 2020 is already halfway through development. <laughs> um, it's at least an 18-month process. Mm -hmm. even, even the Night Timber X, that was almost, it's been almost a year since that project was started. Um, it simply takes that long. <laughs> yeah, it's not as simple as people think. I, I do see comments saying, hey, all you guys did was stuck some lights inside of a timber. Hey, it seems like it'd be, it'd be easy to do, but it's not. They come in and modify the 3D CAD, make new tooling to make channels for those, and then also still have the structure to make it strong. Yeah, and even that aside, um, back to the Night Timber X, since you brought it up, there's a voltage regulator in there for the LEDs and it has uh, numerous ports on it. Uh, we could use it in the future for even more LEDs. Um, that voltage reg regulator was installed because the LEDs were getting hot when you flew it on 4S and they try to melt the foam over time. <laughs> so we had to come up with a regulator and at the lower voltage the regulator puts out, it doesn't really do anything discernible with the brightness of the LEDs. You can't tell a <laughs> difference whatsoever, but they stay cooler. So it doesn't melt the foam. Well, things like that take a lot of time to work through. And then you have to have electronics people to design the item. 
then it has to be approved by numerous people. It has to go through compliance testing so that we can sell it here in the States. That's months. That's not overnight. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I think the big thing that most folks don't realize is the compliance side of the business. And it's so boring to talk about, so we won't get into it, but I mean, and for all of our compliance engineers, we love you, but I mean, I, I as a marketing guy, it's like the driest topic possible, but I mean, for, um, you know, for us, it's, we can't cheat. We can't short the system. We can't get around the topic. You have to have everything by the book legally. Uh, and, and that's just, that's how horizon rolls. It's just, you know, we're not going to, Put out something that is uh, not compliant or not FCC compliant. I mean, it's that's a big, big, big fine uh, that we don't want to deal with, and, and and nor should our customers have to buy a product that's not compliant. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that just that part of the process, as small as it may seem to the end customer, is such a big piece of time. Uh, let alone all the flight testing, all of the other vetting process that happens internally through our, you know, f just from test flying to you know, finance, accounting, you know, purchasing, executive level, all the things that all the corporate red tape, <laughs> uh, that stuff does happen. But it uh, it takes a long time to develop a product. I mean, the fastest we've ever done was, you know, I think, I don't know about in the history of Horizon, but since I've been on the air side, we've been able to turn certain uh, multi-rotor products faster back, back when that was a little bit hotter. Uh, yeah. But that was, you know, we sent James to China for a month and a half and just said, figure it out. And he designed and developed and got the factory line running and all that stuff. So there's there's a lot of pieces in the puzzle. And I don't think customers see that and they shouldn't have to, but it's kind of cool to know the full background because yeah, it's it's certainly not um, it's not just a plug and play. And there's never a time where we go shopping at China. That's why we have all these developers within the company and all this years, like Gary, years of years of passionate RC experience that helped develop the best products in the industry. Right. Yes, it's, uh, again, a lot more than just buying a timber, putting lights in it, changing the ESC out and calling right. it a new product. It's It was not that simple, guys. And uh, I know you guys even did some fine tuning on the power system. I think you, you tried different things to see. But really, in the end, that power system works pretty darn. In fact, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you helped to develop that TimberX power system before we I, launched the original one. I did that power system and the turbo timber power system. And those were existing motors, but we played around with KVs and props to get something optimized for the use. Um, we went back to that and we tried to make it a little better on the night. And it's um, pretty well optimized for what it it's is. It's pretty darn good. It's impressive that it works pretty good on 3S and really right. amazing on 4S. And you don't have to change anything. You don't have to change the right. prop out. You don't have to change the settings in the ESC, nothing. Just swap right. a package. Oh, it's pretty impressive. And that's really, really hard to do because if you understand the relationship with the higher voltages, going from 3S to 4S, you're actually putting two and a quarter times the power through the system. You would think, well, 3S to 4S is only a 30% increase. No, it's 220% increase to the power or 224, <laughs> I believe it is. Um, so to make something work on both is very, very difficult. And also that was a reason that, so not a lot of guys know this behind the scenes story, but the, you also worked on the UMX turbo timber and like the larger timber, we started that project with the goal of making it 2S and 3S. Right. And because of what you just explained, it's almost impossible to go 2S and 3S compatibility. Right. 2S to 3S is even harder than 3S to 4S because mm -hmm. the difference in current amperage or current is what creates heat. Heat is what destroys the components. And the difference in current is um, the square of the difference in voltage if you don't change anything else. So yeah, so it's a big difference. And so guys, just so you know, I mean, this is one, of, this is not only like a, a personal passion of Gary's, but you know, we took that and we've been using it at work to make sure that our power systems are optimized, not only on, you know, some of the e-flight airplanes, but I know you've done a lot of work with Ali on uh, some of the uh, Hangar 9 airplanes coming up with right. the recommended motor ESC combination, battery combinations for those. And also the things that you know about, you know, loaded RPM versus the KV of the motor and, you know, what that approximate efficiency is and what that really difference should be. Uh, and then um, even like props, I think one of the things that I remember learning from you a long time ago, and as I, I know this isn't going to be something everybody kind of understands in the chat, but a higher pitch prop 
which ultimately at full throttle can pull more current, can actually give you more flight time right. at a lower right. throttle setting. And right. that's because right. if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that the, the stall speed of an airplane or the cruise speed of an airplane is approximately what it is based on the weight, wing loading, so on and so forth. Right. So if you have right. a higher pitched prop, it takes less RPM to achieve that cruise speed and therefore you can get more flight time. And so I remember learning that from a post on, on RC groups that I remember reading from you. And I was like, wait a second. And I went out and I took a, a Habaco Superstar EP and I went from, I was flying like a 10-7 prop on it. I put a 12-10 prop on it that was pulling like, I don't know, twice the current. And I went up and I flew that thing for almost an hour and a half, just throttled back. And it was amazing how little throttle it took to stay in the air because it had a combination of, you know, more thrusts, but also the higher pitch speed of the prop. And then it just flew more efficiently, so yeah. to speak, in a lower throttle setting. Well, when, when you're driving down the interstate in your car, do you have it in first gear and have your foot to the floor when you're driving 70 miles an hour? Or do you have it in fifth gear with partial throttle? Yep, exactly. exactly. That's a very, very good analogy. And again, I know a lot of guys aren't going to get that and maybe don't even care. They just want a power system that works, which is exactly what our job is and what Gary's job is, is to give you guys an out-of-the-box experience that's pretty darn good. And I think uh, UMX Turbo Timber is a great example where we tried our best to get 2S and 3S. Yes, we kind of wanted to go 3S, but then we're like, you know, a lot of people have 2S batteries, so you, let's try, and, and I think you did. You maxed it out to as much as we can get out of 2S on that power system. Uh, yeah, that's that's as much as you can get out of it, and flying, it lasts forever and ever, but speaking of that single airplane, if you hold it in your hand and run it a couple full batteries, you're going to get something too hot. <laughs> um so it, it's absolutely maxed out on 2S. I'm making some notes here, guys. I'm looking at the chat while we're talking, just keeping track of some of your comments here because we'll get to some of them towards the end. Um, but yeah, I think that power system science, so to speak, is uh, black magic to a lot of people. And that's okay. You know, it's our job to make it easier for you guys. And I think the Turbo Timber, UMX Turbo Timber, the Timber X are great examples. What's another power system that you put a lot of time and effort into? Uh, in an e-flight model uh should i have to think because i've touched on so many of them um, pretty much everything i think you've had a hand in lately yeah since since i've been there in the last couple of years i've touched pretty much all of them <laughs> well i've got a question from the chat i'm gonna pop it up here uh yeah. not related to power systems but related to the timber x um so can the night timber x do any sequences like the flight test night radian Actually, um, no, it cannot. The voltage regulator merely powers the LEDs in the plane. Uh, there, there are no electronics in the voltage regulator to control sequencing of the LEDs. Yes. Okay. So are they single color LEDs or they, are they RGBs? They're single color. Okay. So, yeah, you couldn't, you could, even if you put a controller in, it wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that answers. Yeah, I'll say from like a, a practical use standpoint that the night radiant, I love it as a product. It is so peaceful and relaxing to fly. And it's actually kind of nice because you can watch the lights and enjoy the lights without having to worry about flying the airplane. Obviously the Timber X, night Timber X is a very different animal. You right. can do 3D with it and having multiple colored lights doing different things would almost distract from being able to fly the airplane. Well, in my opinion, um, I think the bright white lights with also then having the navigation lights on the wingtips and then also even having the beacons on the belly and on the top of the tail help a ton for maintaining orientation, especially when you're doing aerobatics and flying uh, 3D. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just popping up other questions, so feel free to jump in. Um, and yeah, 300 milliamps is just fine for the UMX Turbo Timber, a 2S300. Uh, yeah, 2S300. <laughs> That power system won't last very long on 3S. And when I say not very long, I mean seconds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I think the control unit that's in there is set up for 2S and 3S. So that hardware can handle it. You know, plugging in a 3S isn't going to blow up the control unit immediately, but the motor is not going to be able to hang. No, not at all. Yeah, the, um, the ESC and the board that's in there will handle 10 amps on 3S and 15 amps on 2S which is a lot for an airplane that small and light. Um, the, stock's, the stock setup only draws about seven ounce static and about four in the air. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, here, I, I wanna pull this up. Uh, uh, shout out to May Walker. 
um, very often joining us on the show here, which is great. And I saw this as an idea. And in fact, we actually did talk about this at one point. And we decided this is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds great. I don't know, man. If it was a night V900 going 120 miles per hour. <laughs> I don't know. It would scare me. I would get nervous. I don't think I would. You can fix it with like $6 in LEDs and there you go. Right. Uh, have <laughs> That'd be crazy. And so real quick, I want to give a shout out to some of the uh, other guys in, that are joining us. Uh, it looks like the RC sailors are on. Hey guys, I think that might be Nate and or Abby. Um, and then also pilot Ryan has joined us, both of which have already put out a number of videos on the night timber X. So if you guys are interested in that product, be sure to go to their channels uh, Pilot Ryan Media, and also the RC Sailors on YouTube. And you can see uh, some of their current videos and then also love some videos in the future. In fact, I think both of them are trying to get out and fly it in the dark here shortly so they can get some actual night flying videos out there. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to pull up. This is a good, this is a good segue topic. Um, is uh, I think we, we kind of talked a little touched on this earlier, and you guys have, may have touched on this on other streams. But um, you know, for the three of us, really, what's the process for deciding what planes we're going to produce? Um, well, I'll start and you guys can fill in the gaps because I know I'll miss something. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, the way it works is someone like Gary or Allie or anyone on the team, even Jason or myself, will, will pitch an idea to the team, uh, whether that is during a true product planning session, which we have various times of the year, or just, you know, we wake up one morning and go, I got an idea. Um, and sometimes, you know, those ideas are great and sometimes they're not very good. Uh, but those will come to the team meetings and we'll discuss and iterate and kind of throw some ideas back and forth. We'll think about what price point it could be at and what feature set the price point could command. Uh, we'll look at what vendor could do it best for us, you know, what what partner we have in uh, overseas that could help us produce it. And then from there, uh, it goes through what I like to call the corporate red tape. Uh, and it, it goes through uh, various levels. So we bring it to a uh, initial meeting that we call a, um, an SDA meeting. And that's more of a, do we think this concept holds water? Does sales want, do sales want it uh, on both on the online side, on the wholesale side? Um, does it make sense financially for the business Do we think we can sell this many units, yada, 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 all that fun stuff. Uh, as it goes through the process, um, and then it gets, you know, tooled and money, it, we, you know, Horizon signs off on, the a concept and that concept sign off unlocks the ability for us to pay for things like tooling and that sort of thing. And I'm sure I'm missing steps in between here, guys, but I'm trying to paraphrase. So this is an 18 month process. Uh, and then we, then we bring it to um, other meetings and uh, there's another meeting called the forecast meeting, which uh, is the, here's the final product. Once we get it kind of approved and through the development process and then all the guys develop on it and uh, you know, uh, iterate different CAD samples, whether it's CAD or a, uh, what you, what's the, what, it's just a five axis C and seed sample in many cases when it comes to foam stuff. You know, it's a, it's like beer cooler foam that's been carved out of a CNC machine uh, and it's been flown and carved on and glued surfaces to. And some of the, one of these days we ought to bring on um, a plane that's been a, a show that process. Right. Every time I bring, every time I bring someone through horizon and tour the facility, um, I always show them some plane that has been out already, but the early version of it. And it's it looks like, oh my gosh, how could that have been a product? And you have this, you know, it's essentially like the I don't know what Gary, what's the type of foam? It's EP called EPS, expanded. Yeah, it's EPS. it's yeah. basically beer cooler foam to a degree. And carve carve it out. out. Yeah. And you can see the carve lines from the CNC router. It's pretty cool. So anyway, there's the development side of it, then there's the business side of it, right? And so once we get to forecast. The product is basically done. It's tooled. It's you know looking pretty. It's good enough for marketing to then take and do photographs. Um, and at that point, we that's when wholesale sales and the consumer division, which is our online guys, they say, "I want to sign up for this many units and, and blah, blah blah." So we do all that fun stuff, uh, and then eventually it comes to market. And in between all of that, there's the marketing process. There's the compliance process. You know, there's purchasing. There's the manual has to get written. Jason and his and the, and his team, which was Cody, is now Craig Greening is going to be helping you out a little bit more. Um, they have to go through all the marketing deliverables. You know, get the video done, get all the web banners and all the other places we're going to advertise the product. All that has to go into effect. And then on top of that, when we're in a normal year, uh, we would be going to shows and events and figuring out where is the best event to show this for the first time and 
what mm -hmm. print ad does it need to go on what magazine do we want to send it to Nate and Abby or pilot Ryan or whoever to do a review on. So all these decisions are happening in the process. So, and again, I, I know I've missed stuff, but that's kind of the, uh, minute to two minute synopsis of how a product comes to market. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that we have to do is balance out a lot of other considerations. We don't, so we may come up with a list of airplanes, but after we have that list of airplanes, where they go in the next two years is also dependent upon, you know, what brand it's in. Um, is it a warbird? Is it a jet? Is it a 3d plane? Is it uh, you know, a wood arf? Is it a foamy? All of those, we look at that and we try to balance it out. We don't want to have a bunch of warbirds in a row. We don't want to have a bunch of ultra micros in a row. We don't want to have a bunch of trainers in a row. We try to, to space it out so that way the market can absorb it. Otherwise, if we came out with five warbirds in a row, um, first off, I know the warbird guys would think we're amazing, but then the rest of the world would hate us. <laughs> so that's why I mean, you guys can see even this Night Timber X, which I got to tell you, it's outselling expectations already. So it's, it's going to be a hit. And I know there's a couple of guys on here that are really hating the idea of us making another timber. But one thing I did is I'm going to share my screen real quick because I posted this yesterday uh, on RC groups to show the, the very wide variety of products we've come out with in the last year. I'm just going to summarize. Since in 2020 so far, Night Timber X, the UMX Citation Longitude Twin 30 millimeter EDF, the A1064, the Hangar 9 Cub Crafters X Cub, the Hobby Zone Sport Cub S2, the UMX Turbo Timber, the Air Tractor, the e Flight P51, the UMX Ultrix, the Twin Otter, the SU30, the F18 Hornet, Hangar 9 Tiger 30cc, EC1500, the Apprentice STS. If you guys look at that, I mean, it's amazing how, how different all of those products are. And we had to space them out accordingly based on when they're going to get done, you know, with the time of year they're coming out. Um, there's a lot of considerations. And so the one thing I wanted to stress is if you guys don't like one of our releases, it, I guess it's okay to say that, but don't go poo poo and us and everything we do saying, we don't know anything about anything. You guys don't care about us. That's not true. Wait two or three weeks and see what the next one is. And if you don't like that one, no problem. Wait a couple more weeks, you know, in a, a year we're coming out with approximately two dozen new aircraft. That's a lot. And that means almost one every couple of weeks. And right now things are delayed a bit because of COVID. That's a little different situation. So we're not going to have as many releases this year as we originally planned, but we still have a lot more to come. And, you know, guys, things are just ramping up and we've got everything coming out from, you know, foam to balsa, from ultra micros to giant scale, from prop jobs to jets. There's a little bit of something for everyone. And we're not going to make everything that makes everybody happy all the time. And that's that difficult balancing act that we're trying to look at the market look at what we got in our warehouse. And that also leads to the point of how do you decide to discontinue an item? I was going to bring that up. Exactly. That's <laughs> it's like I read your mind. It's a perfect segue because that's exactly how we decide. We don't have unlimited space in our warehouse. We have a very, in fact, I'll say this real quick. I don't think a lot of people realize how big Horizon Hobby is. You know, we got 400 employees. We got 80,000 items in our warehouse. We have a giant warehouse, but there's a limitation in how much you get. Right. And so we, can't possibly just come out with an airplane and keep the last airplane, the, the oldest airplane that's not selling. So the weakest links go away. And I know that a lot of guys say we're wrong and discontinuing this, wrong and discontinuing that. But remember, guys, we see the sales numbers. We know the MOQs of the factory. We know how much space we have in our warehouse. And if a product is not selling well enough to keep it in the lineup, it goes away. Now, there are outside occasions where we don't make that decision ourselves. Sometimes a factory goes out of business. A component is no longer available. Um, maybe something happens to where the product's just not in vogue anymore because the market has moved on from 3D foamies or whatever it might, flat foamies, whatever it might be. And so all of those things go into the consideration that that product's going to go away. I will say this, sometimes products go away because they're going to come back better. So not every product goes away indefinitely. You guys may have seen, I mean, we brought some products back over the last couple of years, Carbon ZT28. That was one where... You guys, it just stopped selling. People weren't buying it. I love the Carbon ZT28. It's amazing. It's not perfect. It's got its things, but it's dang good. And it's a great value at $550. But you know what? We hear it all the time. Oh, I'm not going to pay $500 for a foam airplane. Well, hey, if you guys don't do that, we're not going to be able to sell it. The good news is we brought it back. It's selling pretty well so far. Um, but when we got rid of it, we heard a bunch about it. But at the same time, everybody that complained hadn't bought one in the year prior. It just wasn't selling. So yeah, I think the easiest way to sum up, you know, that, that question that's on screen now is, you know, we, 
we, like Jason said, we see the sales velocity throughout the year. Uh, we see what it launches at and then where it trickles down to or where it trickles up to, you, you know, depending on the product. Um, and at a certain point, it it doesn't make sense to order it again because it would take more than a year, for example. This is just, you know, it may, may take six months, it may take a year, it may take two years based on the current demand. Um, so let's say, let's say something sells 100 units a month and we have 500 units in stock. Well, we know in five months that product's going to be out of stock. Well, if the MOQ of the factory is 1,500 units and we only sell 500, you know, 100 a month or whatever, you can kind of do the math and go, shoot, we're going to have this for the next year and a half or more. And that's going to hurt us from an inventory standpoint. It's going to, you know, we're going to have aged inventory if you're into operations and you know what that means. I mean, that, that gives, that's other implications for the business. So we do, we look at that and then we look at, okay, how is this going to upset our customer base? Obviously you guys, we care about, uh, we don't just go, you know what? I love taking off people. I almost said something else. Well, you know, I love making a customer mad. No, we never do that. What we do is go, does this make sense for Horizon? Does this make sense for the brand? Um, and can we order it or can we do something on the marketing side to ramp up demand? Can we, you know, can we bring it to an event and reintroduce it to people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, have people just forgotten about it because we've released 10 other aircraft in, the, in that yes. year? Those types of things are discussed. Um, honestly, every single week on the air side, Jason and I, you know, Jason has a marketing fix wing meeting and we talk about trends and we talk about, you know, all the different things. And sometimes the operation stuff comes up and then we have an ops meeting and that's where all the purchasing team members and product development and uh, leadership around the, around the category talks about stuff like this. And, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. And again, we don't make decisions lightly and we certainly don't want to discontinue something unless it just financially doesn't make sense. And I wish we could share like the, the, Hey guys, based on this, you know, X, Y, and Z, we can no longer bring this to market. Unfortunately, we can't share that with you guys, right. um, but that's how the thought process goes. Yeah. So I hope that, hope that covers it clear. Yeah. And so May Walker, that's, that's kind of exactly what Steve just said here that, yeah, we've thought about this. We know something's going away. We got about a month's supply. I kind of just tipped you guys off earlier in the video that the night vision air, we got about a month's supply and when they're gone, they're gone. And the night Timber X is replacing it effectively, not a one for one replacement, but we don't need two, three capable night flyers. Let's put it that way. And so, you know, the night vision air is a great example of an airplane where the MOQ on it is about a year supply. So not only would it take up space for almost a year, but it would also tie up a lot of dollars. Those dollars we can't spend then to buy parts for other existing airplanes, bring in the next new airplane and extra parts for it, so on and so forth. So one thing I will say, you guys have probably noticed, and it's not hundred percent perfect all the time, but when we discontinue a product, we usually buy a few years worth of parts to support it. Now we can't always get those parts because sometimes the factory says, Hey, if you're not ordering airplanes, I can't make those parts. Like for example, the foam airplane parts, the foam airframe uh, components, um, or a factory goes out of business or a sub supplier goes out of business. So we try our best to support the discontinued products for as long as we can. And that varies depending on the part and depending on the factory we're working with. Um, but you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. We don't like to do it. Like Steve said, our goal is not to sit around thinking, how can we make customers mad today? Let's just <laughs> this one. Oh, let's make sure that prop is out of stock. This will be fun for everyone. You know, guys, we don't like to be out of stock, off stock on stuff. Our purchasing people are held to a very, very high standard. Their goal is to have like 98% fill rates. So that means almost nothing out of stock ever. And so when things run out, trust me, they are harping on the factory to figure out how to get it made, how to get it shipped over here. And so on and so forth. Ah, good question. That's minimum order quantity. Uh, you can't just ask a factory to make five of a foam airplane and ship them to us. Um, there are minimum amounts that they can produce at a time. But in addition to that, you have to think about filling up a container. We ship things here based on can, how many will fit in a container. And if we don't fill up a container, then the cost to ship each one goes up. So that plays into the decisions that Steve and Jason were um, mentioning. And Gary, when you had your own business, I suspect you didn't just cut one kit at a time. You probably were like, all right, I got 20 orders. Now I'll make kits right. because right. it was the same um, kind of. That wasn't horizon. So I'll, and, and it's been gone for over 10 years. So I'll actually talk some real numbers. <laughs> um, when we introduced the original E3D, I thought if we sell, you know, 100, 150 a year of these kits that I'm putting together in my garage, I'll be happy because that'll help pay for some of my hobby. Um, 
I was having a hundred laser cut at a time and I was able to ship out a hundred about every week and a half. Um, I was back ordered for six months. <laughs> we, we shipped 2000 in the first year and a half or so. Yeah. 2000 for a garage operation for a kit yeah. Yeah, for, for a kit for a garage operation. Um, when I quit making those kits, well, we arfed it in 04, 05. I finally quit making the kits around 05 or 06. That was down to um, have 20 album cut, and that's enough for a year. Yeah. So, see, guys, that's a perfect example right there, one for one. So, you had a kit, which I want to say was like 100 bucks. Then you had the arf with like 200 bucks. It right. costs you more money to buy the covering and the glue and the components to assemble the kit. You might as well just buy the ARF. And so right there, you probably were selling hundreds of ARFs a year, thousands a year, and now 20 kits a year. Right. It just, and the, the, desire not to do it. the ARFs of that model were actually the same way. A um, couple of containers came in and they went out very, very quickly. And the last container was about a year and a half to two years to dispose of, so to speak, to use a bad word. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 It's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic. And when you're on the business side of things, you see these numbers. And I know guys out in the market, you don't see things every day the way that we do across a very wide range of brands and categories and subject matters. And it's a lot, I'll tell you, it's a lot of information to process. Sometimes I got to shut off my brain because it's just like information overload if we focus on it all the time. Um, and that's also why we try our best to make sure that we remind you of old products still. You know, we don't just market the new stuff altogether. And you'll notice if you get a, a model aviation magazine now and you flip it over to the back cover or the inside front cover there, you'll see our ads and you'll see we're not just showing you the newest one. Now we're showing you the newest one. And don't forget, we have to have a couple other warbirds or a couple other, you know, a 3D or sport airplanes um, because the market does move so quickly and everybody always moves on to the next new thing. It's almost like, hey, don't forget. We just came out with a Mustang two months ago or we just came out with, a, you know, an EDF a month ago. You know, guys are like, oh, you only do timbers, you only do cubs. No, that's not all we do all the time, guys. Don't forget. Um, you know, a little bit of everything. The Mustang is a bad example, Jason, because you can come out with a Mustang every month and they'll always sell. Uh, that's true. No, that's a good point. That's true. And the guys hate hate when I bring that up. They're like, no, why didn't you make a, a Stuka, right, Steve? Why didn't yeah. you make a Stuka? The world's best for your <laughs> literally the ugliest or one of not the ugliest, but one of the ugliest world war two airplanes ever. And he, the, he knows we're not making that anytime soon because we can make a Mustang that will outsell it by 10 times. We can make a Corsair that would outsell it by eight times. You can make a P 47 that outsell it by six times and it will take just as long and just as much money to develop a Stuka that we know won't sell as well. So, Hey, I, I personally want a P 40 so bad. But I've seen sales numbers, and I know, guys, there's no point for me even asking for it. You know, a 1.5 meter P40. It's just not going to happen when all the other ones will outsell it tenfold. And back to your question that Steve so eloquently answered of how do we decide what to produce? We're all models. Um, all the product developers are modelers, and we get passionate about something. Uh, last year, there were a couple airplanes, one in particular. I actually designed, built at home, made a proof of concept. A lot of people flew it, worked really, really well. And then um, we run the numbers and it just doesn't work out. So we can't do it. Yeah. And, that, and for guy, I mean, I guess I'd give him a little bit of background on that because somebody asked, how do you decide which ones don't make the cut? That was a cool product with a lot of potential. And we actually wanted to make it as a kit and then even as an ARF. And the numbers just, it doesn't work. I think we're talking about two different things there. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of variation in um, considerations and it's not just what we're passionate about. You know, Hey guys, if we could do everything we liked, it, our product line would look a lot different than what we have now. And um, I think it, I'll give a good example of a product that, that most people at the company weren't even sure about, which is the Timber X. When uh, David and I first started talking about that, people were like, why would you want that you want a tim with a <laughs> shorter wing on it that does 3D? That's the strangest thing I've ever heard of. And you know what? It's become almost as good of a seller as the regular turbo temper, which even surprises me. I thought people would dig it, but people really, really dig it because, hey, you can do stole, you can do 3D, 
and it just looks a little different, you know, but at the same time, it flies just awesome. All right. Let's talk about the elephant in the room since everyone's brought it up. I'm going to pull up one uh, comment in a minute. No, don't, it better not be about a red airplane. <laughs> <laughs> no, it couldn't be. Uh, <laughs> let's, no, no, that's going to be the, that's going to be the comment. So I, I, I can't even find a comment that I really want to bring up, but so everyone's been asking, where is the Draco? Where is the Draco? Are you doing a Draco? Um, and I know every time we have a Thursday come by, everyone's like, is it going to be that week? And uh, yeah, unfortunately, not this week, guys. Not next week. Um, maybe not really this summer. Um, but, you know, we we are working. Yeah, they, they, um, you know, we are working with Mike Patey on an aircraft. Um, but we can't talk about which aircraft and when it's coming. Uh, that said, I know you guys are excited about it. I know we're excited about it. Um, but you know, it's just, it's just not ready for prime time. So give us some more time to work on it. And, uh, I promise you when you see it, you'll be excited. Uh, it's the, those are the same words that, uh, actually Ford motor company use when they talk about the Bronco. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the it's, it's, the Bronco is coming. Yeah. The, yeah. It's like, Hey, it's maybe something coming, but you're going to be excited when you see it. So guys, uh, I know, I know it's hard to contain yourself, but, um, we are developing a great relationship with Mike and, uh, you know, he's already got the horizon logo in his back wall at his shop. If you watch his YouTube channel. So, uh, we're working on some cool stuff with him behind the scenes. And I know as much as I want to pull an airplane out and be like, here it is. Uh, you know, it's just not, it's just not there yet. So just, just hang tight. Give us some more time. In the meantime, the exciting news is we've got a boatload of stuff on the way. We've got new stuff coming every week for the most part. Um, we've got, you know, stuff all across the business. So as, as much as it pains me to say, I can't announce something now or next week, right. week after, you know, it's, uh, it's a project that we are all ultra passionate about. And it's, I know something that you guys will be blown away by once you finally see the final product. So, yeah. So don't the next, you know, m many Thursdays for the next few months, guys, don't, don't keep asking us if it's that, and then be disappointed if it's not. <laughs> Because it's, okay. can, but it's it's not going to be that in any time immediately soon. So, uh, but something's in the works, and we know you guys will like it when we're when we're done with it. And hey, if it's if it's what you guys want it to be, it's it's got to be right. And we're going to take the time to make sure <laughs> yeah, it's right. It's the type of thing that you know when we when we kind of had that live stream with with Mike at Oshkosh, we knew that we'd stir up a ton of uh, we'd kind of poke the bee's nest, so to speak. And uh, we knew people would be like, okay, something's happening, especially when we're standing next to a particular airplane that Mike was, uh, that happened to fly there. Um, but, you know, it was just, we knew this would happen and it's okay. We wanted you guys to get excited and uh, I cannot wait till, till uh, this releases and uh, you know, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. How do I get a job at Horizon? Well, um, you know, we have uh, horizonhobbyllc.com. And uh, you can look at the job boards there. Uh, you can also find it on the bottom of horizonhobby.com as well in the career section. Uh, we're always looking for great talent. We've got a uh, we've got a product oh we got product development spots potentially. No, I don't think anything are open right now. I know we have a associate brand manager for the trains category that just opened up. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's exciting. And I'll soon have uh, Cody's position up on the site. So hopefully, if anyone wants to to replace Cody. We're looking for a great marketing expert in the air category soon. It's not available yet, um, but we will have that job rec up uh, shortly. So, you know, with, with getting a job with us, it's, it's the same as any other company. There's a standard interview process. Um, you know, we typically like to bring you out to the, to the organization in Champaign. We do all of our surface development and stuff out in California. So all the air stuff is done where we're at here in Champaign. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of trains. Actually, we yeah. saw a yeah. lot of trains. Yeah, many people don't know. So this was um, this is a fun story. A few years ago now, this is probably I'm going to be wrong. Something like five years ago, we decided to split <laughs> uh, split Horizon Hobby train stuff off to um, another different a different site. And it's the same reason why. And there was a question earlier. Do you guys sell Tamiya? Actually, yeah, we're one of Tamiya's largest buyers. Um, but we don't put it on horizonhobby.com. And if you wanted to see our full selection of Tamiya stuff, just go to Tower. 
but uh, the, or you can buy it through your local retailer, right? So the whole thing here is we don't put it on horizonhobby.com because that's our core proprietary products. Um, but you can buy it through our local through, through your local retailer. That's why most hobby shops potentially buy to me through us. Uh, but is is uh, <laughs> you have to be pretty like Steve. Yeah, that's no. how you get a job at Horizon. It's I can't true. Even my face. No, it's not true at all. But um, <laughs> yeah, so we have trains. We have the Athern uh, company, Athern brand. Uh, that is that is Horizon's proprietary train brand. Uh, we sell other train stuff as well. You just can't find it on the site. But um, and I'm sure the train team is is glaring at me right now. Uh, what's the site? HorizonHobbyTrains.com. Is that right? No. Athern is on HH. Athern, on HH. I think it's Athern.com now. I should really know this, but I'm not the marketing guy for Athern. But yeah, if you go no. to Athern, it's, it's HH like, Choo Choo guys. H, it's not HHChooChoo.com. I can promise it's you that. But anyway, who, who for Choo Choo? The guys, air hang out? We don't talk about trains here. <laughs> Well, I mean, it doesn't hurt to let people know we got other stuff. Um, no, no, yeah, I, I do want to ask. I, I like asking all of our guests some loaded questions every once in a while. It puts them on the spot. It makes them feel uncomfortable. Sometimes we can see them sweat. So, Gary, what is your favorite Horizon hobby currently sold airplane? Um, it makes people sweat. I'll, I'll, <laughs> answer, I'll answer – as to what I take out to the field and fly the most when I'm just going out to fly. Cause I think that's, that really answers the question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. My hangar nine thirty CC Valiant. It's a good flying airplane. Yeah. I do see you yeah. flying that a lot, especially with the electric setup I've got in it because it, well, I'm an old man and it's an old man's airplane, but with oh, the electric, with the setup I've got in it, it'll hover, it'll torque roll, it'll leave a knife edge loop, and it's a 30cc airplane. And I think it's one of those things that fits in the category of the greatest pro product we've had for a long time and still have that no one knows about. Yep. Yeah, I would say all of the Valiants are that way. The uh, E-Flight yeah. Valiant is uh, like one of our best kept secrets. It's not that we intend it to be, it just is. It doesn't seem like people see it and go, ooh, that's sexy, I got to own it. But everyone that has one, it flies freaking amazing. And so right. Craig Green, if I'm not mistaken, did almost all the design work on the original 30cc, which we then scaled down to the E-Flight. And then we also did the uh, 10cc kind of in the middle there. And they're all phenomenal flying airplanes. They may look just like a typical high wing, you know, kind of boring, lazy flyer, but all of them are far more capable than that. Knife edge, point right. roll, right. inverted. They're just smooth and they're elegant and locked in and... I, it's hard to describe it, and I really think more guys should try one. Right. Yeah. And um, going back to your question, if you wanted to, uh, I, I think I know who said. Who, you see this, Gary? Who do you think that is? <laughs> That's from our own team. Oh, it's got to yeah. be Craig. It's got to be Craig. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be Craig. Um, Craig, you know you can select your name and not the brand to post with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, you had to. If you if I had to pick an E flight airplane, like a, a recent airplane, it would probably be the Air Tractor. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's the Air Tractor is freaking awesome. It really is for what it is. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those in my basement, so <laughs> it's not something <laughs> I can take out all the time. But oh. I do. I the the Valiant's first. The Air Tractor would be a current airplane. Um. And you talk about the the little Valiant, the, um, the foam Valiant. I actually have one of those also in my workshop on floats because I have a little lake behind the house. Uh, nice. The night timber on that lake last night. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah, last night was actually a pretty nice evening. It was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little it's still a little cold. I don't know what's up with our weather. I think I think it's still in the sixties, fifties. Oh, it's too cold. It's because nobody's driving, so there's not enough pollution to make it warm. Uh -huh. I don't know. That's for your global warming folks out there. That's a <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, then uh, another similar loaded question. Yep. What is your favorite Spectrum transmitter right now? Uh, the one that I don't have. Ah, yeah. And, see, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. I was curious if you'd say that because I know we've seen a couple of questions in the chat about availability of the IX-20. Yeah. Uh, and it is an amazing radio. I don't have one. Gary doesn't have one. A lot of people in the office don't have them because they're hard to get right now. They, they take time to produce. Um, and I know the dates keep shifting out on them. So my strong suggestion is 
If you want one, you need to pre-order. So, well, at this point, back order one, either through horizonhobby.com or through your favorite retailer. That's the only way to reserve a spot on the list. So that way, if we sell out, because that's what happens. Sometimes when you see the date shift, it doesn't mean the shipment didn't come. What it means is that shipment sold out. So it may be imminent. And there were, let's say, I don't know, 50 of them, right? Well, 51 guys ordered. So the, the 51 and everybody after him is going to have to be in the next shipment whenever that is. So again, if you want to get your hands on one, you absolutely have to back order it right away. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Outside of that thing, Gary, what's their favorite transmitter that you have that you can use right now? IX12. Yeah. Yeah. I have an IX12 and a DX9 that I use some. Um, I like both of those, but I like the IX better. Um, you didn't ask about receivers. Um, if I had my druthers, a 9350 would be in everything that I own or a 637, but some mm -hmm. of them more, more slots, more ports. Right. Yeah, that's the only catch is on occasion you want to separate out more channels and, and you need that nine channel receiver. And 9350s, if I'm not mistaken, we got them back in stock finally. Right. I heard, that. I heard that. So that's a good, that's definitely good news. So then, uh, all right, well, do you have a favorite battery? Um, anything that's 12 S. I think every, everything should be 12 S. <laughs> okay. It should be 12 S 300. Bigger playing oh, that's 300. 5,000. I know you were you were mentioning smart, but I had to get in there about the high voltage thing because I'm yes. a guy. Um, Fair yeah, the smart 6s 5000s because they weigh the same as the 6s 4000s that I was flying from a previous brand that no longer exists. <laughs> yes, the uh, Spectrum Smart batteries. I know guys they hear us harping on them, and a lot of guys think it's just a bunch of you know marketing fluff. But man, the batteries are good. Gary and I have been using lipos since the beginning of lipos, and I am telling you guys, it's not just because I work at Horizon. If I didn't work at Horizon, I would be buying Spectrum Smart lipos, not just because of the smart features; those are great, but also because they're small and they work really, really well. They're light. They're powerful, they're reliable, and they're consistent. And that's what you really want out of a battery. Yeah, it's called it's called energy density. The energy density is higher. Like we were talking earlier about um, when LiPos first came out, we got really long flight times. Then everyone realized, well, I can go to a smaller battery and get a whole lot of power for a short flight time. Um, well, these have a much higher energy density. It's like a bigger gas tank for the same weight. Um, so that's more efficient in my mind, and I like efficiency. But you didn't mention the number one benefit. The number one benefit of a smart battery is the self-discharge function to storage value. Yes. Um, that's the number one benefit. If there, if there was nothing else about them, if they were the same energy density, same weight as everything else, I'd still want to fly those because of the self-discharge. Yes, I agree. That is by far the most convenient time-saving thing for me. I stress because I've been using LiPos a long time and I know what harms them the most. And what harms them the most is always leaving them fully charged. Right. And guys do it all the time. They don't think anything of it. And I'm telling you guys, you're just literally throwing money away. Right. Every day you leave your battery fully charged is damaging it every day. Yes. Oh. Certain people I work with that I fly with, um, they have a battery case. And they leave everything fully charged all the time, all the time. And we go out to the field and we're testing something and he pulls out a battery that he hadn't used in a little while and checks it and says, yeah, it's at 98%. It's fully charged. And we put it in and it's, it's a dog. Warm. And then I'll hand him a battery and I'll say, plug this in and the airplane works fine. Well, leaving them fully charged is the absolute worst thing you can do. Absolute worst, guys. It's even worse if you're storing them in a hot place like a hot car, hot garage, hot warehouse. 50% uh, storage, you know, charge, give or, you know, right around 3.85 volts per cell, give or take, plus or minus. It's not exact, but half charged or less makes a huge difference in the longevity of the cells. And uh, I just, you know, again, Spectrum does it on its own. So I agree with you. Even if that was the only thing that it had to offer, I would still buy it in part because of that reason. So. Right. Yeah, it's a big self discharge is the one uh, they have many benefits. The self discharge is the one feature that's worth buying. Now, this question that came up on the screen from John Lang uh, Does the 12310T use the smart data direct from the battery or does it need a smart ESC? 
The actual interface to pull that data off the battery is the ESC. So you would need a smart ESC to do that. Yeah. Yes, I think it, it's it, you have to you you could get other data out of the battery without having the smart ESC. Um, you know, obviously on the ground with a checker, but if you want it real time in flight, you have to have the ESC. And in addition to that, the ESC has to plug into an SRXL port. That's a serial port in the receiver mm -hmm. in order to transmit that that telemetry information. And I'm not sure if the PowerSafe receivers have an SRXL throttle port. I believe that's only the 637 and some new receivers, um, some other new receivers that are coming out. Yeah, I see. Uh, I wanted to pull this question up because this is some things that, you know, we've, we talk about this kind of stuff a lot. And then the latter part I want to, I want to answer as well. Um, so, you know, we've actually been looking at EPP foamies, flat foamies again, because a lot of us remember how big that was. Gary, I'm pretty sure you flew flat foamies back in the day and I'm yeah. sure Steve did at some point. Uh, and then 3D balsa arfs, that's another thing. I mean, that's right down your alley, Gary. Uh, so, yeah, I think we see we see signs in the market of a renewed interest in 3D flying. I think the Timber X is a great example of a plane that kind of blurred the line between stole and 3D and maybe somehow potentially bridged that gap. And so I would say it's possible. Uh, and, you know, we work with guys like Jay Stucia, who would be a great, great asset in something like that. Um, so I would say... Yeah, certainly something we're considering. Uh, but then that latter part of the question, the replacement fan for the Havoc XC shows discontinued. So the uh, Havoc had the V1 80 millimeter fan. We now have a V2 80 millimeter fan, which is in the F-18 in particular. Uh, and so that fan, the V2, is available. We need to probably get our website updated to show it in the parts list. But if you just go to our website and you look for 80 millimeter EDF, you should see the version 2. The version 2 is identical in shape. And so it'll drop right into the V1. The difference is it's made out of a different material that is balanced better and runs smoother. So it's not necessarily a higher performance fan, but inherently because it ends up being better balanced, you usually get better performance out of the box. So I did want to bring that up and I'll make a note. I really do need to double check the website and make sure that that's been updated. Yeah, Jason, speaking of uh, the website, when is the is the manual for the Timber X almost done, or are we just waiting on the PDF to be produced? Yeah, so we are updating the manual to add a little bit more information, um, in particular related to the reversing. And so if it's not up there, it will be up there very, very shortly. And again, that manual is a little bit more in depth because it has smart, the airplane has smart technology and the original one did not. And one of those features is the uh, optional use reversing. Gotcha. Oh, we lose Gary. Yeah, I think he bounced uh, out for a minute. He may have lost connection there, but that's okay. We can, we can keep the show going. Keep the show going. That's what I'm talking about. So, uh, oh, Ultimate. So yeah, yeah. Ultimate 3, yeah. That's... I think that's a play on Ultimate. It was the Ultimate Squared, right? Ultimate 2. And that's mm. now Ultimate 3. So, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind an Ultimate again. There's Gary. I'll pop him back in. I'm Welcome sorry. back, buddy. It's all good. Gary, what do you think of this? What do you think of this comment? It's interesting, huh? <laughs> that's really interesting <laughs> yeah we'll leave it at that moving on yeah that's <laughs> really interesting we'll leave it at that <laughs> uh, there we go. It, it, yeah i think it did go up overnight i did see some emails yeah. about that yesterday and so if it's not there right now maybe just uh, clear your cache and refresh or try it in another browser but i was also pretty certain it went live this morning so in, in most browsers if you hit f5 it clears the cache and then you can reload um, and I, one thing I want to point out is that a lot of times when we develop a product and we get the manual done, it's done sometimes like two or three months before the product ships. And there are a lot of times when we update the manual. So my suggestion is even if you get a manual in the box with your airplane, go to our website and download the electronic one there and maybe reference that one because that's usually, well, that's always going to be the most up-to-date version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hopped into another browser window in order to um, see if the manual was already posted and then I closed the wrong one. That's why. Ah, uh, that's where you went away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. 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 Yeah. So yeah. see what other questions are. Oh, look at this. This is an interesting one. Yeah. You know, the blue angels have been in the news a lot. I think a blue angels F-18 would be cool. I don't know what you guys think. I think it'd be cool. I think so. I think that would be a perfect product to bring back. It would be perfect, wouldn't it? Well, we have an F-18. Wouldn't be hard, just saying. 
Wouldn't, wouldn't be hard. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, guys, you see someone wants a slow ride. We need to bring that back. Oh, yeah, there it is. There, yeah, yeah. Slow ride. That was one of Gary's designs, as a matter of fact, for those that didn't know. Ah, here we go. Here's a good question. So, Gary, I'm going to leave this one to you because I think you have a good understanding of this. Um, to answer that question directly, if you order a normal ESC, one of the new ones, you cannot have reversing. Only the ESC that's going into the Knight Timber X will have the rever reversing feature at this time. It's different firmware in the um, ESC itself. Yeah, so, and I think down the road, though, all those ESCs are updatable. So there certainly will be uh, potential options in the future to put reversing on other ESCs and in other models then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Oh, what's this one? Oh, 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 oh. Ah. That's a good question. That is a good question. E what do you think, Gary? <laughs> EPS is expanded polystyrene. It's what we think of as beer cooler foam. Um, EPP is expanded polypropylene. It's a little bit harder fat or plastic. Uh, it's different. And if you think yeah. about um, EPP versus EPS, EPP is more the shells of the foam cells, whereas EPS or beer cooler foam is the actual cells or the the um, spheres themselves. Now, EPO, which is the foam that we use, is another type of expanded polypropylene. It's um, expanded yeah. polyolefin. Polyolefin, yeah, that's what I meant. Um, it's got some of the benefits of both the EPO and the EPP. Um, you've got the closed cell, so you've got a good surface, but it's got some flexibility like the EPP, so it's not as brittle. It's just the best, best choice for the job. Yes, it is. Uh, and, th and there are times, you guys may have noticed um, over the last year in particular, uh, the E-Flight UMX Ultrix is a good example. That airplane is actually EPP. We were able to test it as EPS. It was usually our CNC samples. First ones were EPS. That's just the car. It's easier to carve that foam. And then we had samples in uh, EPP and EPO. And we found that the EPP of that in that particular plan form and that size and that weight it was the better, more durable option. Uh, and larger sizes, EPP tends to be a lot heavier or noticeably heavier. So usually don't use EPP. Um, and then also with EPO, we've been experimenting with uh, different densities recently. And so some of you guys may have noticed that a lot of our more recent releases have smoother finishes where you don't see the beads as much. And then also they don't gator as much. And then maybe you, may, you probably haven't really noticed this, but they don't ding as easily and they don't dent as easily. And when they break, they tend to, to crack more than, than compress. So, uh, you know, that's something we're continuing to work on because we do want to, you know, not just keep foam the same old, same old. We actually want to make foam even better if we can. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you, the, one mm -hmm. of the benefits of EPP is that it bounces really, really well without breaking. And if you <laughs> own an Altrix, which is a delightful little airplane, or you've seen someone fly one, you know that bouncing is something very important. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's very important. So I like that airplane a lot. If you guys don't have, haven't flown an Ultrix or haven't watched the videos on it, I, may, I know you may see it and go, I don't know about that. It's weird looking. But man, it is a blast. It can do yeah. Yeah. It can do sport flying. Um, it's small. It's easy to transport. You can fly it in a lot of places. Use a little 1S battery. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. That's another product that uh, many of us were like, really? When James brought it up and, you know, you look at it, you're like, yeah, okay. I mean, it's not like a P-51 or a F-18, but yeah, I mean, they, they walk. <laughs> I've whacked that thing in the light poles. It's true. Like I, I have one, I have one of the original test samples, which is from the batch that we sent out to like the sailors and stuff. Right. But it's perfect. And it's, I mean, we, we beat the heck out of those things. And uh, it's just fun to do flat spins and all kind of – it's, you know, jam the sticks in the corner and then pull out at the last second. It's kind of fun. It's a really good airplane. 
Yeah, this has been coming up most weeks. Um, and also I've seen some comments on Facebook and on YouTube about uh, getting a response through product support customer service. So yeah, the last month, month and a half, our sales and our service and support, everybody has been overwhelmed. Uh, you know, the world is in a strange place right now and we're seeing volumes for calls and emails that are even beyond what we see after Christmas, which is usually our busiest time of year. So uh, just this week, we brought back some staff to help um, actually, we repurposed some staff. We took people that you know normally worked in one department. And we actually put them now into product support, customer service, to try and help us get caught up on the backlog. Um, right now, I would say email is probably going to be the longest time frame before you're going to get a response. Two to three weeks, unfortunately, depending on what you're asking about. Depending on what you're asking. It could be faster than that. I would say they're probably prioritizing service and support questions over sales inquiries. Uh, yeah. Phone is the best way to reach us, but unfortunately you either have to wait on hold or you need to use a callback number option. There's also, many of you don't know this, that I didn't know this until a week ago, we just implemented a new chat functionality. Uh, so, um, and we'll be working with chat a lot more from a service perspective as uh, we roll our site into a new platform soon. Um, but ultimately it's gonna allow you to, just to have a chat window open and um, our chat volume is significantly lower because not many folks use it yet to compared to email and, and phone. So if you are willing to chat, use the chat functionality. Um, it's definitely a great way to get in touch with our team. And yeah, like Jason said, we've brought staff uh, in from different roles uh, that are, you know, for example, our trade show guy, he's not able to do trade shows right now. So he's now helping out with the consumer support. Um, you know, we've got various people throughout the business. Uh, we have a guy that runs our print shop in-house. He's not able to be at the office, so now he's going to be helping customer support. We've also reached out to our uh, brand ambassadors, our team pilots, and team drivers to come in to work kind of like I call it the Uber of product support. They can clock in for two-hour stints and do product support on the fly. Um, so they're able to do that. We're piloting that program. And we only have about, you know, a few a few spots that we've opened up, um, but we will absolutely be expanding that if it works well, which we think it will, which will significantly cut down on the, the time you have to wait. So, guys, we get it. Our service team, you know, we look at the numbers um, as, a, as a company every week and say, well, you know, call volume is X, call wait time is Y. Let's figure out how we can fix this. Um, so it's not something we're just like, yeah, deal with it. You know, all of our supports are based in the U.S., and so we have to find people who are completely capable of, of handling a very challenging phone call from RC standpoint. Um, and we're working on it as hard as we can. Trust me, there's many people, including our COO, who's actually calling and interviewing team pilots <laughs> to bring them in. So if that doesn't say who is, you know, the importance of this particular topic, I don't know what does when you have a chief executive officer jumping in on it with both hands. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it's kind of a, or sorry, chief operations officer. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. We want to fix it. We're working fast to try to fix it. So please uh, please hang tight. Yeah, but Andrew said chat worked well this week. So please use the chat functionality. Um, you'll find it on the site. You can it'll pop up on the bottom right corner, I think. Um, super cool. Yeah, this uh, – hey, Brandon, that definitely – I think I, – maybe I saw your video on, on Facebook. It was a weird, very strange thing. I don't know what the heck that's about. So that is definitely a – what I'd consider product support related issue because they're probably going to need to get you four new servos out of stock. The one catch is I did see that the servos are currently out of stock. We will be getting more next week. So uh, my suggestion is to try that chat, see if you can go through that route and if they can at least get you into the queue to potentially get a phone call from one of the guys that knows that product very well and maybe has some experience in that situation. I've not seen that before. It's very unusual, and I do wonder if – it seems unlikely that all four servos went bad. I wonder if it's something else, maybe the receiver, maybe wiring harnesses. So keep reaching out. Why harnesses or extension leaks can cause that on those servos? Um, I actually found those servos to go in the TimberX initially, and they're such good servos for the cost and for the size. I use them in a bunch of personal airplanes. Um the servos are very good, but that could be his extension stream, extension leads. Yep, yep, exactly. Oh, hey, I want to, oh, yeah, GB Linda made a good comment here because I saw May said, don't listen, 
Jason says you never break props. I've never, ever, literally never broken a prop on an Ultrix. And Cody, on the other hand, broke a lot of props. And I'm like, Cody, what are you doing? And I watched him land. And it was two things. One, he wasn't cutting the power early enough. And two, he wasn't getting the nose up. And that's a good, good alternative. Turn it into safe and just high alpha that thing in and plop it down yeah. into the ground power off. And I bet now, granted, if you're landing on pavement, you might break the props, which is why I put that little nose skid in there. But if you're on grass, I doubt you're going to break it. I really doubt it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wouldn't say doubt it. I saw Cody well, do it. The other way to do it is just to get it into a flat spin. <laughs> just let off at the last second. I've done that. <laughs> times. Or land it like Ali. Ali lands his like this, full throttle nose in, bounces it, and then takes off again. So you can just do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so Brandon, I, we see your comment there. And like Gary said, I think it could be as simple as the extensions or the Y harnesses, not the receiver. It's the connectors between the servo and the receiver. You know, there's additional connections in there with the Y harnesses and with the uh, extensions. And sometimes those leads can have not good contact uh, or not deep enough contact. So I would just wiggle those around. If you have some other extensions, maybe try those. Um, and hopefully we can get you, get you solved real quick because... Yeah, he, like he's like Gary said, and he, you mentioned here, Brandon. You tried other servos. Those servos, they're very, very good, and they might pull a little more current than these Emac servos, and so that could be a part of the issue. So bad connection at the wire leads, high, you know, dropping the voltage to the servo and doing weird stuff. It was definitely unusual. So, yeah, that's that's definitely not a typical uh, yeah. typical issue. So. Cool. Yeah. And Mary Boozer, Wes, yeah, you're right, man. I got to tell you, our product support guys are, they're all of them, you know, guys and gals. Uh, they're they are doing the best they can. And we as a company are doing the best we can to ramp things up as quickly as we can. Uh, but like Steve said, sometimes questions are not easy to answer. And a lot of the newer people that we hire, especially they don't have product uh, experience, they need a training uh, time frame, And so, you know, not everybody's going to be up to speed 100% all the time. And maybe not everybody you talk to is going to know your product very well. And they may not have the answer that you need. And don't be afraid to ask for maybe somebody else who might know better. Uh, but at the same time, give some slack to all the guys, especially the uh, guys and gals, if you get them on the phone. Definitely. Uh, Jonathan Gruber. You know, <laughs> I love his profile picture. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, is that a, is that a pandemic beard? No, I think he's been growing that for a while, huh? Yeah, he's a he's a yeah he's he's working on his own airplane, growing a beard, playing poker every night. That's that's a pandemic beard. Well, I don't know what else you want. <laughs> Just, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I.e. Steve Petrato, or oh, Steven. Oh, you guys are on that kind of basis. <laughs> I think he's just because he sees. Oh yeah, I don't know. <laughs> full on pandemic. Indeed, um, I'm yeah. I'm doing it too. Steve's doing it. I see that yeah. Gary's still shaving. Yeah. The rest Gary, of us are the, not. You're just not the kind of guy to sit around in sweats and work from home. I think you know you're, you're the kind of guy that's got to be fully dressed up. Well, you know, <laughs> guys, but I I get up at five in the morning and I've got this routine and I I have to shower and shave and come into the office for the computer. I, I can't change routines very often. <laughs> that's yeah, right. I know, or very I know I like some people. Uh, that's my dad right now. He, he doesn't have to go to work, but he's still going to work every day, still waking up. I think he texted me last night. He's like, yeah, 4.30 comes quick when you're old like me. I said something like that. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. This comment well, here, I, I agree. Um, we're, we're, we've are we're we looked into it. Um, we're in the process of uh, – updating our website. So we're going to take that one step at a time. Um, so hopefully if everything goes smoothly, which we have a lot of people working on that, um, don't worry, we won't let you guys down. Uh, so that, that will happen and then maybe we'll get to the mobile side of it. Um, but the new site will be much more mobile friendly. It won't be specifically an app, um, but um, don't worry, we'll have uh, some much better functionality in the near future. <laughs> Hey, Jonathan's got all kinds of comments. Thanks, man. It is definitely very gray. Yeah, it's true. I'm not dying it. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. So, so hey, uh, yeah, what else can we talk about here? Because I wanted to make sure that, that if anybody had questions for Gary in particular, because, you know, Gary doesn't always get on these chats with us and doesn't always make it to a ton of events, not to mention, unfortunately, we're not going to a lot of events right now. So if anybody has any questions for Gary, please put them in the chat here. Uh, we don't have them for a lot longer because at five o'clock, we are going to be going live with Real Flight, 
Uh, so Steve's been hosting that weekly. We're going to be yep. flying. If I'm not mistaken, you're going to be flying a triple tree tonight, huh? Yeah, we're going to get everybody on the new uh, RC Group's Triple Tree uh, site made by Jim T. Graham. If he's still watching, shout out to Jim. So we'll be on there uh, jumping around between sites. We've got uh, Andy Ziegler on who's going to be talking about our trade, our event strategy that we're changing up for all the uh, all the event date changes for our signature events. And I think I'll have Dustin on there as usual if his internet survives. Maybe James. And I know, Jason, you're going to try to join us a little bit later once you get something else done. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, please join us. But yeah, if you guys drop in questions now, both Facebook and YouTube. Hey, you now let's. Uh, <laughs> Jim, it's still watching. Yeah. <laughs> what what is he? Doing? What's he got there? Is it? It's like a. It's just a little, little Jim T drink. Little Jim T drink. <laughs> beverage. Little Joe Nall beverage. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. oh, you know this. Is, this would be Friday night at Joe Nall, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it would be. Yeah. That is what by far that is one of the best nights of the whole event. Friday night, the barbecue, and uh, nine times out of ten in the many years I've been there, the weather's actually been pretty good Friday evening. And so yeah, you can just enjoy flying right there. I love going to the lake Friday night and just flying there until it gets dark. And hey, now with the night Timber X, I can fly even past dark. So right. not this year, but well, fall not, not in the fall. Hopefully we'll be there. Oh, yeah. Wolf. Yeah, he was there. Wolfred's here. That's my dog for those that don't know. Here. Come here. You were you were just up here now. You don't want to get up up there, but it's all right. All right. Any questions for Gary? Let's see. Um well here's one. I you know I would say, you know, same crappy undersized. Okay, so here's one thing I will tell you guys. I've been flying RC for about 30 years, and I can count on one hand how many servos I've stripped. And I can also tell you that most of those servos I stripped because I abused the airplane. So I'll fly, I fly all of our stuff stock and I've never stripped really any of our servos through normal use. So if you're stripping servos, it's because you're not handling it properly. You're being very hard on it. Now you say it's cheaper to put metal geared servos in than to support plastic servos moving forward. That's not true. Metal geared servos cost considerably more than a nylon geared servo. That's why we are selective in the products that we use them in. Um, it's unfortunately not a one for one replacement. So I'm not saying that metal gear is not better. I, it definitely is, but I'm also going to say it's not cheaper in the long term. And also you really shouldn't be stripping gears. If you're stripping gears constantly, I definitely would look at how you're handling your models. Um, not only when you're transporting them, but how you're storing them. I see guys store airplanes laying on their surfaces all the time. I watch guys bang their elevator into door frames, getting in and out of their car, and they think, oh, no big deal. And then the servo stripped and they blame the servo, but it wasn't the servo's fault. I mean, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is if things can happen, certainly the stress on a plastic servo is the same as the stress on a metal gear servo. It's just the type of plastic, the, the material can strip quicker. But yeah, I think, you know, while it's, you know, I always err on the side of a little bit more even keel. I know, Jason, you're kind of like, uh, it's your fault. <laughs> but if, for me, yeah. it's like, I, I get it. it. It can be uh, very much how you handle the model, um, how hard you push the model. And, and I would say everything, and Gary, you can probably attest to this, with all of the stuff that we develop, there is a stage in the development process where we try to break the airplane. And you know, it's, In the air, yeah. yeah. In the air, yeah, it's not just on the ground, but in the air. So talk a little bit through that. I think that's a good segue. Yeah, it's actually very, very scary if you watch us do some of that because we do things that no sane person would ever do with the airplane and do it repeatedly over and over and over again. <laughs> and recently we've actually started using sandbags and statically weighting things um, just like they do with home-built airplanes in order to see the true strength of a wing before we go up and fly it. And then we film the stress testing most of the time so that we mm. know if something breaks, we can go back and see where it broke. Um, we also put the, um, the spectrum telemetry G meters in the airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Recently um, we tested something that, um, we thought it should handle um, eight G's in the air. Um, there's no way we, we could get it past 8.1 in the air. And we tried and tried and tried. Um, we actually statically loaded it to nine G's with, with sandbags. So we do a lot of that. It's not that we take an airplane, we see that it flies okay, and we release it to the market. It's not like that at all. <laughs> They're flying for right. months and months, and we try to break them. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you guys elaborated on that because, yeah, I might be, it might seem like I'm a little harsh when I say that, but if you can see these examples. Guys are posting, you know, here, Martin Roy says, Gene stripped one when he hit a curb, and like Jeff in Lower Alabama, he stripped it because he banged the surfaces. I just, I guess I really hope that people learn to not blame the product or the stuff that's in the product if it's breaking, that sometimes how you're handling it and how you're using it is really the the potential issue. It's not just for that product, but for all products. And so there's a learning curve with handling things in, in our hobby. Um, you know, how hard you can move things or, or twist things or bang things and how you can store models. And, you know, again, metal geared servos are better. And we really try our best to put what we believe is the best combination of uh, performance, durability, and value into every product that we come out with. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I wish we could spend 10 extra bucks on metal geared servos, but that you'd think everybody would be willing to pay more, but they're not. We see the comments all the time. I wish that was $20 cheaper. I wish that was $10 cheaper. Or I wouldn't pay $10 more for that. So a lot to keep yeah, in mind. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point, Jason. I think the, the value proposition of a product makes a big difference. And yes, yeah. uh, we would love to put the top end stuff in literally everything. And if it was my way, you know, if there wasn't anything to worry about as far as, you know, profitability, dealer margins, all the other stuff we have to think about, you know, it's not just us having to keep the lights on. It's all of our retailers. And so it's not that we're trying to overly uh, inflate the cost of our product. We're trying to keep it at a great value by putting the best possible components in for the price point. But ultimately, yeah, is there better? They're always going to be better. I mean, I don't own a Ferrari. Uh, I would love to, but, you know, I my F-150 works pretty good getting me to work and back. Um, but it's, you know, it's just that cost proposition that we have to kind of always keep in mind when we're doing this. I saw a couple people bring up, uh, they were trying to wear a link shirt. But I thought, I thought we, I thought we sold spectrum shirts. We do, yes. Yeah, you can go to the site, type in spectrum shirt and then there you go. Uh, or spectrum uh, hat. Or, yeah. or you can type in armor shirt or blade, you know, whatever blade shirt. We sell these shirts online. Uh, it's got a blade logo on the back. Um, yeah, there's tons of apparel. So, ah, yes, Nathaniel. So, at Radiant XL is one of those. It is retired now. Um, it is a, it, you know, gliders are an interesting thing. Every once in a while, we get a glider that's just a massive hit. And a good example of that is the original Radiant. Uh, and then we made a Radiant Pro. It didn't really sell so well. Then we made the Radiant XL. It sold okay. Uh, the Night Radiant is still selling very, very well, in part because the original Radiant design is just magical in a lot of ways, and also because of the lights. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, if you can't, if you want one, you probably can find one, hopefully, out there in the world. Um, but we I, no longer. The comment I have there is: there's so many times where we Horizon are out, but there is tons of them in the market. I mean, even recently, this isn't air related, but the SCX10 3 from Axial. I mean, we've been out, we were out for a while, right? I think we might even be out now, but there are so many retailers out there that have them. Um, I think we actually have Check hobby shops. I would start there. Yeah, I agree. Start there. Check with your local hobby shop. Try online hobby shops. They may have one still still in stock. Help them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. There's one that you worked on, Gary, Turbo Timber. I think you like the Turbo Timber, don't you, Gary? I love the Turbo Timber. Um with the Night Timber coming out, Night Timber X coming out, I am actually flying it more, and I have one here. I don't have a Turbo Timber here, but I actually prefer the Turbo Timber to the Timber X normally because of my flying style. I don't do as much 3D now, and yeah, it's faster, and um, it's different strokes for different folks. Sure. Yeah. I love yeah. it. The Turbo Timber is my go-to for – yeah, um, for like well, any float fly, I've got a little pond out back. I can go float fly. Joe Nall mm -hmm. float flying is my favorite. You know, I mean, my brother, I've got him started. He learned to fly on the turbo timber, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. And now he had he bought a UMX turbo timber, so he's into the he's a timber yeah. he's a timber fan for sure. Um, he called me the other day trying to figure out why why the airplane was uh, like kind of like snapping out, and I was like, that's not normal. And I was like, open your battery hatch. Oh. After he flew, and his battery was just like thrown in the back of the airplane. Yeah. Like, you got to use Velcro, man. It's called tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'll be tail heavy indeed. So Jason Beaver did say he loves T28s. Yeah. We love them too, man. T28s just fly good. Yeah, all sizes, all shapes. Of well, I say shapes. They're basically all the same shape, but. <laughs> 
And we, we will always have T28s in our lineup. Maybe yeah. not as many as we used to because the yeah. T28 is not as popular as it once was. Um, but yeah, man, that 1.2 fly is freaking phenomenal. And the Carbon ZT28 is awesome. Uh, real quick on that, because somebody actually asked that earlier in the uh, chat. Um, we did actually change the retract units on those um, not long ago. And so the newest batches of those do have the new retracts that are less likely to fail. Um, they don't have the, they don't trip the overcurrent protection as easily. So you're going to have better and more reliable retract operations. So yeah, that's definitely a, a thing. And T28s, man, just awesome. <laughs> this one, I'll, uh, I'll give the Spectrum team a shout out for sure. The 637T is, is awesome. And I know John Adams and uh, Tom Cogswell and those guys have made some great how-to videos. Uh, but the 637T is, is a pretty sweet product. So I know Miguel... Yeah. Miguel Alvarez on the engineering side. I'm sure there's many others, um, but I know he had a big hand in it. Um, so, you, you know, if you see Miguel at the field, maybe buy him a beer afterwards because he had a big part of that. <laughs> and that kind of segues into, I did, and I couldn't find it now. I, a couple of people have asked the question, um, will all airplanes in the future get smart? And then will you have the option to buy it with or without smart? And mm -hmm. 637 is a part of the smart ecosystem because it is a smart receiver. It's the the receiver that allows us to get data that comes from the smart ESC and then send that back full range telemetry to your transmitter. And so uh, I would say we're, we're planning to put smart in as many models as we can. There are considerations depending on um, price point partly, but also availability of other receiver models and, uh, and then ESCs. If it's a twin, for example, it may or may not come with that. Um, so not every model will come with smart in the next few months, but in the future, more and more of them definitely will. And when they have smart, you won't be able to get a version without smart. Of course, we'll usually sell a bind and fly basic, which comes with the AR 637T and then we'll have a PMP without, but both of those would probably have a smart ESC in them. Uh, correction, the bind and fly basics will come with the AR 637TA receiver. Yeah, so. it, oh, let's talk about what's that difference there. Yeah. The the TA receiver in the bind and flies doesn't have the Vario in it. So you can't get uh, altitude or climb and descent uh, velocity information or VSI if you're a full scale pilot. Um, whereas the T you can, um, yeah. that's, that's the only big difference. And that's not really a big difference. I don't know that I would ever use the Vario in there to begin with myself, um, except maybe in a helicopter. Um, the TA version of the firmware does not allow the um, customer to do all of the programming through forward programming like the T version receiver. Mm -hmm. Those are the two big differences, the Vario and the forward programming. Yes, the yeah. forward programming, that was something I, I wasn't quite sure about. And, and that may change in the future, but in the short term, uh, the TA is what will be installed in Bind and Flies and, and or Ready to Flies if we ever have that with the 637. Um, and it's kind of like the 636 and the 636A. They were very similar, but the A version did not have the extra port for a satellite receiver. And the reason we have those lower, those other A versions is because they do cost a, a, you know, a little bit less to produce, which helps us get the price of the airplane down a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to step out and get prepared for the real flight live, but Gary, thanks for spending some time and you guys can keep Probably. chatting for the next few minutes. I'm going to bail. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Glad I, Good co host today. Yes. But, uh, I'll see you guys back in a different seating position, but I probably won't be on video, but we'll be on the Real Flight Live here in 15 okay. or so minutes. So I'll see you guys in a bit. Thanks, guys. Yes. Oh, here's a question, Gary. AC Air 637T, can it have safe select? Um, it's a really good question. You can set up safe in there. Yes, 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 it does. Yes, it does. It does. Yeah. Unlike the 636 where we locked it down and you couldn't, the 637T will allow you that option. Uh, right. And so there's different settings and things in there, but it can be done. Um, let's see here. And uh, oh, somebody asked a question about variable pitch propellers. So I know, and I think this is coming up because of reversing. So in the Night Timber X, Gary, when you use the reverse, let's say you're doing it on a down line. Right. Even if you did full power reverse, it's not going to back up, right? No, it's not because our propellers are optimized for one direction. 
And when mm -hmm. you spin them backwards in reverse, you're only getting a portion of the thrust. I haven't measured it, but from doing a lot of flying with it, I would say 60% of the normal thrust you get going forward. So um, no, you can't you can't hover it nose down. Also, you don't have any airflow over the control surfaces to control it if you have it nose down to begin with. And um, the reversing feature is an absolute riot to play with. It, it brings a whole new dimension to the airplane. However, if you're going to do vertical descents with reversing and slow it down and then try to do really low, uh, short ground rolls, um, yes, you can land and get it down to about a one inch ground roll from where the wheels touch. Uh, takes a lot of effort and a lot of practice to do that. And you can get yourself in trouble with reversing because it's, it will slow the plane down enough that if you don't get out of the power, you don't have any control authority to flare. So it adds a new dimension to the flying, but um, be very, very careful when you start learning to use it. Yes. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. And so there, I believe that as Craig chiming in there, just to reiterate, you can definitely set up safe select on the 637T via forward programming. It's way easier. You don't need a computer. You, when we say forward programming guys, just so you know, that means you're literally going into your transmitter, just like you're setting dual rates or something. And you're going and you're setting AS3X gains and safe select uh, all those settings right there in your transmitter. And the, the reason I paused when you initially asked that, yes, I, I know you can set up safe select <laughs> as a user, but when someone said safe select, I was thinking the um, differentiation of the way you bind it with the plug in and with the plug out. Yeah. I don't believe that you can set it up to do that as the customer. Right. Um, but Good you can point. safe don't safe on a switch. So yeah, you have safe select. Yeah. So you won't be able to set safe in your radio and then bind it with or without safe select. When you set it in your radio, it's you have it. There. Yeah, and you just have to make sure that the switch is appropriate, working appropriately, and you have to set appropriately. So, yeah. Ah, one other thing. We get this question a lot. Throw us a bone on a promo code. We don't have promo codes typically, guys. You know, we do sales a couple times a year. Um, and so just keep an eye on our website, Facebook page for the next sale. Um, I think there might be something in the works. So, hey, you know, keep an eye out for that. Uh, we don't typically offer promo codes that work across our website. Um, uh, because then uh, we also have the complication with um, different platforms and then also uh, dealers as well. So um, no, no promo codes at the moment, but keep it on our website. There should be a sale coming pretty soon. Oh, here's a good question. Yes. It's, uh, AS3X is perfectly safe to use on gas models. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I was flying a 9350 receiver in a 60cc gas model not two weeks ago. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So the nice thing about that, Charlie, is you do not need a programmer with the 637T. It's fantastic. It is the future. Forward programming is so much more convenient, easier, on the fly. It's a lot of great things. So definitely go 637 for sure. And then uh, here's a good question. Uh, are we discontinuing the Night Vapor? The Night Vapor is a Park Zone branded product, and we have discontinued the Park Zone brand as a whole. You know, that said, not all Park Zone airplanes will be gone forever, though. So, um, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a lot of videos out there on setting up the 637T, which is, uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time. And, yep, make sure, yep, like Victor says, hey, Victor, thanks for joining us as always. And uh, he said, sign up for our, our uh, newsletter. It's the best way to know. Get, your, get our weekly emails, and they'll see when we have a sale. So. All good stuff, but yeah, I guess we're gonna have to wrap up here in a few minutes because again, uh, Steve and some of the other guys are going to be live on Real Flight. Uh, when we do the Real Flight lives, we don't let people join in because the goal is to, we have a special guest, we talk to them, we let them fly a little bit. We try to make sure there's not too many people flying. If we invited people in, we'd probably overwhelm the server and there would just be airplanes flying all over the place. So uh, be sure to tune into that. It will be live this time for the first time ever. It's going to be live on YouTube and Facebook. Normally it was on Facebook, but it will be on YouTube, Horizon Hobby Products channel as well. Uh, and thank you very much, Gary, for joining us. I know that uh, the weather, I guess, isn't amazing, so you probably wouldn't have been out flight testing today. No, no. Probably not, but I know you're going to have flight testing to do next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, good. Always working on something new and cool, right? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I've only got a few projects, you know, half a dozen or so going right now. Are you excited about any of them that are coming up? Um, yes, I'm, the, I can't this, say anymore. How about this very, very next one? Are you excited about this one? The very, very next one's probably the most excited I've been about anything I'll do this year. Yeah, I'm, I love it. it. I think it turned out awesome. It looks fantastic. That trim scheme, everything about it, I'm in, I'm in love. I'm absolutely in love. I can't wait to get my hands on one. I don't have one yet, so yeah, I'm going to have to steal one from you soon so I can shoot a video. So, uh, yep, there you go. You guys have it. So Gary Wright, product developer, Horizon Hobby, um, you know, worked on the Night Timber X, UMX Timber. I forgot the Air Tractor. Kind of forgot about that one. And also um, and Twin Otter, that's right. And our very next release that will be coming out here in just a couple – I guess I can't really say specifically, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks again, Gary, for joining us. Thanks to everybody for joining us. And we'll be here same time again next week, guys, with another special guest. And uh, hopefully uh, next week. Oh, by the way, because I think guys were asking about this. Night Timber X is are coming to us now in the U.S. They will be shipping around the end of next week. So if you want to get your hands on one right away, be sure to you back order slash pre-order today your favorite local hobby shop or horizonhobby.com. If you're in Europe, the shipment is on its way as well. And it will be there in about four weeks, give or take. So uh, for guys that are in EU and the UK, you should be able to get your hands on a Night Timber X around the middle of June. But again, same thing. Be sure to pre-order back order. They're selling even faster than we expected. So who knows? In the climate today, we've been running out of some stuff and we may run out of Night Timber Xs too. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we're going to sign off, guys. Talk to you later. See you next week. Enjoy. Bye -bye. Jason.